worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison door. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise. He hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling storms away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We're the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place And we won't be quiet We're gonna shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet we're gonna shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the lord our god is surely in this place and we won't be quiet we're gonna shout out your praise oh we shout out your praise we shout out your praise kids a hand this morning. All right, yeah, thanks for your help, guys. All right, and welcome to Countryside this morning. We're so glad to see each and every one of you here. We're going to have a time of greeting. Uh, we're going to be singing a song during that time, so make everybody feel loved this morning. The name of the song is called You Are Love, so you got to do that. Uh, if you came prepared with a tither and offering this morning, there's a box in the back that you can do that as well. Uh, there's also a communication card back there, so if you're new to our church uh, or if you're a member that wants to uh, bring forth a prayer request, you can do that with our cards there. So let us know how we can better serve you. All right, guys, greet away. We hide pain in the weirdest places. Broken souls with smiling faces Fighting for surrender For now and the after, yeah Just look around and you see that people Can you say how they really feel? Oh, we are me A little honesty, yeah You are loved if your heart's in a thousand pieces 
If you're lost and you're far from reason, just look up, oh, you are loved. Just look up, oh, you are loved. When it feels like something's missing, if you're hurt when you can't find healing, just look up, oh, you are loved. Just look up, oh, you are loved. We're not meant to be superheroes. Photoshop, all size zeros, a light not expected, but not quite perfected, yeah. Look up, see the sun is shining, there's hope on a new horizon calling you, it's calling you, our love. If your heart's in a thousand pieces, if you're lost and you're far from reason, just look up, oh, you are loved. Just a gobble, oh, you are loved When it feels like something's missing If you hurt but you can't find healing Just a gobble, oh, you are loved Just a gobble, oh, you are you Don't have to prove yourself Don't try to be someone else You Just look up, no, you are love. Just look up, no, you, you are loved. If your heart's in a thousand pieces, if you're lost and you're far from reason, just look up, no, you are love. Just look up, no, you are love. When it feels like something's missing, if you're hurt but you can't find healing, just look up, no, you are love. Just look up, no, you are love. If your heart's in a thousand pieces, if you're lost and you're far from reason, just a couple, you are love. Just a couple, you are love. When it feels like something's missing, if you hurt but you can't find healing, just a couple, you are love. Just a couple, you are All right, as you make your way back towards your seats, we're going to do one more song. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder and show the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we can ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me 
Good morning and welcome to Countryside this morning. My name is Jesse. And I'm Jody, and we want to start by recognizing those that are celebrating a birthday this week. So if you're here and are able to stand up when I call your name, please do so. Terry Blakesley, Dennis <laughs> Fletcher, Delaney Hewitt, Neva Russell, Jerry Lynn Anderson, Edward Brazina, and Carl Ropey. Oh, yeah. And Jackson Carter. Yeah. All right. So, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless y'all, happy birthday to you. All right, ladies, there's lots of opportunities for women's gatherings. They're all located in the grapevine, so if you are interested in joining any of those, the information is in there for you. Um, there's one in Morriston, and there's one in Williston. Um, September 28th and de um, not December, goodness, October the 5th. So look in there if you want to find some things to do. You need to RSVP to the one in Morriston by 915, which is coming up quick. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we are going to celebrate our pastors on October the 13th. Uh, at the bottom of the front page of our grapevine there is a list of our pastors. We have Pastor Bill Keith, Pastor Emeritus Gene Keith, our youth coordinator A.J. Robertson, associate Pastor Steve Carlson, our lakeside pastor Sammy Nelson, and then Mark Shaw, our minister of music. We're going to have a short uh, reception with re cakes and refreshments in the gym. Um, so if you want to bring them a gift or a card or anything, you can bring it that day and we'll have a table over in the gym for them. All right. We just want to say thank you. Um, Bailey and I are going to leave on our mission trip on Saturday. Um, my mom and dad, Giggy and Papa, but Gary Tresca, whatever you want to call them, um, they're also going. Um, they started this, so they were going to go with a team from Westside. Um, we're going to Juno, Juno. I've been corrected on how to say it, Juno, Alaska. Um, and we're going to Echo Ranch Bible Camp, and we're going to be rehabbing their campus for them. I think they're in um, need of a um, kitchen overhaul. So we're taking Papa, who knows how to fix just about everything. Um, and there's Google if he can't figure it out, but I haven't found anything yet that he can't figure out. So um, we've got a good team going. Me and Bailey are going to be um, doing man muscle stuff because they needed some men on the trip, but we're, we're Papa's good assistant. So um, just pray for us as we travel. Bailey has never flown, and it's hard for us to be away from our families for that long. So pray for this man because he's got those babies by himself. <laughs> All right, but thank you. Bailey is fully funded as of today, so we had a couple of donors this morning. So thank you to our church family for helping us go. We want to just remind everyone, Bible Drive Sunday is next Sunday. Bibles have gone up to $4 a Bible now, so I don't know. You can figure out what caused that. Um, but <laughs> anyway... There's two ways to help with that ministry. One is to give money so they can purchase Bibles, and the other is to write messages in those Bibles. I'm sure there's probably some bags of Bibles in the library right now. Take them and bring them back. Don't take them and keep them. Take them and bring them back. No, nothing personalized in there other than your name. You can put your name, or you don't have to put that if you don't want to. Um, but we get a lot of uh, letters that those guys appreciate, and the women too, appreciate those Bibles and those handwritten messages in those Bibles. All right, this Wednesday starts our uh, 
children's ministry, so I'm going to go off script for just a minute because in the office this week, I was sharing my heart with Laura, um, and Miss Connie was in my office that day, and so we just started talking about um, just what Wednesday night kids' ministries mean, and I shared something with them, and they said, you should share that on Sunday. Um, so I'm going to do my best to recap what we said. We were all crying by the end of the conversation, so I'm not going to, I'm going to try not to cry this morning, but... Um, Jody and I started our ministry really early. I remember he was already in the ministry when we got married, working in youth ministry. And um, we just started working. And I remember doing Awanas. I remember AJ being in a walker. I was telling him a funny story. Um, we were teaching in a class, and AJ had his little walker. And he was like, all the teenagers wanted to, to babysit AJ. And I remember we were talking to Miss Connie, and her little Danielle loved AJ so much, and that was her little baby doll. And I remember them running in one day saying, AJ fell off the sidewalk. He had gotten in his little scooter thing, and he had gone down the hall, hallway and, like, flipped himself over somehow out in the court. DCF was not called. He was fine. But um, I just, that was a memory that I was sharing with him about, like, how our kids were little, and I remember it being hard. I remember needing to go home and get my baby in bed, but, like, we were so blessed to be able to serve, and so many people beside us, like, I'm looking in the crowd of, of all the people. I remember um, Mr. Robbie being the coordinator, or the Awana director back then, and just, um, weren't you? Somebody was. I think you were. Um, it was called a commander. Oh, you were the commander. That's why he... You were the you, you commander. Were. You were. Um, anyway, and then, so fast forward a couple of years, so then Bailey comes along and Hallie, and like we had a young family. We had kids. We were tired. We had jobs. Jody worked in Putnam County and would drive two hours to work every day. Um, and I stayed home and stayed home with the kids, and like I get it. I know it's hard. And I'm saying all this to say, like, I encourage people. If you're tired, God's going to give you strength. And people tell us all the time, like, I don't know how y'all do what you do. I do because God gives us the strength to do it. And if he calls us to do it, he's going to give us the ability to do that. And he's going to give us the strength to get through that. We need help, y'all. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 27 years old, actually, on my 27th birthday. And um, that was in August. And I remember sitting. Jody had gone back to work, and I had my kids at home. Because I was a stay-at-home mom, and I was just sitting there, like, literally thinking about what I was going to tell them if I wasn't here. Like, how, how could I relay how I felt to them? They were, we had a four-bedroom house at the time, and one of the bedrooms was a um, playroom. And they were in the back just playing away and just laughing their little heads off. And I was sitting in there thinking, like, oh, I hope I don't not hear that. Like, I hope I'm here to see them grow up. And so, like, I was just in my feelings, y'all. And I was looking out. Um, we had a really pretty like front lawn. I was sitting on my couch just looking out the front door and Bailey comes busting around the corner, four years old. So Annabelle Allen is who like Annabelle is for. And I, I just babysit Allen, Annabelle for the weekend and I, she just was running through my house. And so I just picture that, you know, and she runs around the corner and she goes, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just reading my Bible and, you know, looking out at our yard. She goes, no, you're not. You're worrying. And I said, no, 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 I'm okay. Mama's okay. And she goes, uh-uh. And Joshua 1.9 says, do not be afraid, guys, with you. And then she runs away. And the reason she knew that verse is because she was in Awanas. Like, we had her here on Wednesday nights. She was at church. She was in Sunday school. She was here, hearing the word. Like, yes, we're teaching them at home as parents. But, like, I don't take credit for that. I attribute that to, like, all the people who gave to her and like that verse particularly was one that she had in her little wanna book and we don't do wannas anymore but we do have a program on Wednesday nights and we teach these kids to hide God's truth in their heart and I was as a mom I was touched by that personally I just wanted to share that part of my testimony with y'all because you think it doesn't matter and you think like oh these kids people just want to babysat it's not just that you know, these kids are hearing it all day in school, but they hear it differently whenever it's a Wednesday night. They hear it differently when it's a different person, and you never know, like, which person is going to reach them. So I just urge you, right now we don't even have enough workers to fully staff, so we have people like Laura has said, well, we're just going to make it work. I'll do double duty. People shouldn't have to do double duty, y'all. There's so many of us in this church. 
So I'm begging you, if you are a young person in our church, and by young person I mean like somebody, our age group, and you're not, you don't have a job on Wednesday nights or you're not coming on Wednesday nights, please consider coming and being a teacher or being a helper or leading a game time or doing something um, just to give back to the kids because it's really an important ministry. So I'm going to get off my soapbox, and the only reason I shared that is, you know, because Laura and Connie urged me to, but I just thought maybe somebody needed to hear that and just have a reminder of what um, Wednesday night services are all about and why they're important. And that starts this Wednesday. So join us in the gym. You can close this. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to Countryside. We hope you all have a great week. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you all. All right, I have a team of people that are ready to come up and help share a couple of songs together with us. So why don't you stand, crowd, and we'll get going. Amen. Almighty God, my Redeemer, my hiding place, my safe refuge, no other name like Jesus. No power can stand against you. My feet are planted on this rock, and I will not be shaken. My hope, it comes from you alone, my Lord and my salvation. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word is living in my heart, and I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. You lift my life with greater joy. Yes, I need light myself in you. And I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. My feet are planted on this rock. And I will not be shaken. My hope, it comes from you alone. My Lord and my salvation. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word is living in my heart. And I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. You fill my life with greater joy. Yes, I delight myself in you, and I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. When I am weak, you make me strong. When I'm poor, I know I'm rich, for in the power of your name, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible, all things are possible. Your praise is always on my lips, your word is living in my heart. And I will praise you with a new song, my soul will bless you, Lord. You fill my life with greater joy. Yes, I delight myself in you, and I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. When I am weak, you make me strong. When I'm poor, I know I'm rich, for in the power of your name, all things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible, all things are possible. Amen. Now remain standing as we keep singing, because he keeps us singing. Amen. All right. <laughs> There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all of 
life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This Lord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of His grace, resting neath His sheltering wing, always looking on His smiling face, that is why I shout and sing, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Kids down, watch out. There's, there's movement in the house. Kids town is headed out. Our pastor is not here today. He's preaching at uh, Melrose, Eliam Baptist Church in Melrose. That's the church that has offered us their grounds and their building, their gym building and so forth for school for Lakeside. So he's accepting that call from them to open up a school there, and he's sharing with them what's headed that way. So he's gone, but we had Michael Allen waiting in the wings to give his Kenya report. So welcome Michael Allen up as he, as he gives his report. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. This is called bringing the wood on Sunday morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. And you're not getting this suit, Alan. You, you asked me for it in the men's room, and it's, which is inappropriate as it was, but you're not getting this suit. <laughs> well, good morning, church family. And um, I can't see all of you because it's so bright up here. I may look like a deer in headlights. But those lights are really, really shining. Yeah, it is a little warm up here, too. And I want to just, again, my name is Michael Allen, and I've been a member here for probably three or four years now. My kids have grown here at Countryside Christian School. My oldest is here. He's 18. He started here when he was four. And um, we have four children. And Jackie's here somewhere. I can't see her. Um, Annabelle's here. And, um, and Max is here. Um, but I want to thank you and thank the pastor for the opportunity to preach. It's, I take it very seriously. And um, I was really up late last night preparing and finishing it. I don't normally do. I'm not great with the, with the PowerPoints. And normally if I get the, the privilege to preach... I just come up and just shuck the corn. I don't worry about all the, the technology, but I wanted to, to put together a PowerPoint. So I was up very late last night, and I couldn't quite get it. And 
And um, my wife had to help me this morning because she's, she's very good with, with technology. And um, she's just better than me and everything. So she, she helped straighten it out. And um, so I was running late. And, and thank you, Bob, for teaching our Sunday school class um, this morning because I would not have made it. I was actually didn't even get here till 10 a.m. And I was really racing down Newberry Road. I won't say that I was speeding, but I was, I was moving along pretty quickly because I wanted to get Mark. The power, I know Mark likes to have the PowerPoints in by Friday so he can check for bugs and things. And I got it to him at 10.05. And, and, and so I'll own it if there's something wrong because he didn't even have a chance to, to check for bugs. But I was running, you know, moving along Newberry Road and, and coming down. And um, I just remembered about the story that I heard about Billy Graham. And uh, he was coming from a trip somewhere and coming off the plane, and there was a, a limousine there waiting for him to take him to wherever he was going to speak. And he asked the limo driver, I've never driven one of these before. And he was up there in age. He's like, I've always wanted to drive a limo. And the driver said, well, why don't you have at it? I'll drive in the back. So Billy Graham driving, and he gets a little lead-footed and, and, and starts speeding gets pulled over by a, a North Carolina state trooper, rookie state trooper. And uh, state trooper, when he sees that it's Billy Graham, he gets really nervous. Because Billy Graham at this time was Billy, the Billy Graham that, that, that we know. And he calls back to his supervisor and says, you know, I, I don't know what to do. I have a very, very important person here. What, what, what do I do? And he was speeding, going pretty fast. And the supervisor said, who, who is it? Is it the mayor? Said, oh, no, higher than the mayor. Okay, son, who was it, the governor? Oh, no, 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 this is higher than the governor. Okay, son, who is it, is it the president? Oh, way higher than the president. <laughs> okay, son, just, just tell me, who, who is it? He said, well, I think it's Jesus Christ because he has Billy Graham as his chauffeur. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. But I did read it on the internet, so it must be. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kenya, but I do have a message prepared uh, for today that I wanted to share with you. It's it's from a, a small book, but a very powerful message uh, today, and it, it deals with missions. It deals with the Great Commission, and I'm gonna show you the Great Commission in the Old Testament. Um, but before we, we, we get there, I wanted to thank you all for your faithful support of our, of our Kenya project. Um, we've, you all have generously supported our mission here, at least since I've been here for the last four trips. I've been going there since, since 2013. Um, and since 2013, we've uh, planted 40 churches. And when I say churches, I'm talking about a congregation, not a building. And that's, that's glory to God. In, in an area um, in, in northeastern Kenya that is uh, up near the Somalia border where no missionaries go. And in most cases, in most times that I go, um, I'm usually, we're usually the first white people they've ever seen before. They've heard of us, but they've never actually seen it. And some of the kids get a little spooked. They think we're ghosts. Um, it's it's kind of neat, and no no missionaries. It's so far out that even most Western missionaries uh, never go out there. But you know, there's people that live out there, and there was no evangelical churches, nothing uh, back in 2013, and and by the glory of God, there is now 40. And these are not just flash in the pans. These are churches that if you came with me, I could take you to a lot of these and show you that every Sunday they meet, and and they're growing. And this t picture of this beautiful tree, this is one of my favorite trees. Um, it's just, to me, beautiful. Um, that's a church building in Kenya. That's where most of the time we plant our churches, is under a tree just like that. We don't go there with construction teams. We don't go there to build buildings. We, we go there to build congregations and to follow the Great Commission of, of sharing the hope of Christ and making disciples. And, uh, and teaching them all the things that Jesus said uh, to do. So that is an example of a church building. And um, since 2013, thousands, 
thousands have been saved on, on these short term. I've done 10, 10 short term mission trips there and we've, we've seen thousands saved. I can't even count anymore. They're just, they're thirsting up the gospel and it's, it's a simple message. It doesn't have to be complicated. It's a story. I'm a storyteller and the Bible is a story that is meant to be told. And I love the story. I, I get emotional just thinking about the story, just talking about the story, and, and recapping these results just gives me emotion of joy. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a quick recap. Um, this year, in 2024, we were able to plant five new church congregations. This is one of them. This is my, my good friend Steve. Uh, Gregory, who I've, he's been going since 2000. This was his 30-something odd years going. I've been with him for the last 10. And um, this, is, this is one of the churches that we planted out in the, in the bush. And five, five new churches. And on a, one occasion, we, on a Sunday, we visited a church that we planted last year under a tree like this. That church has now built their own building a year and a half later and has grown in size to where we had nearly a hundred in the worship service. Again, this congregation was 18 months old, planted in, under a tree like that, has built their own building, which means they raised their own money, um, and their pastors are, 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 are preaching. We have a great system um, with our in-country missionary that, that trains and educates bush pastors out there in the bush, theologically. And when we, when we plant a church, they automatically have, they have a pastor there to serve them. And, that's, and, and, and grow them and nurture them. And at that one church that built this building, uh, we had you know, three, three new salvations that day, but 69 rededications to Christ. Just 18 months later, after they had already given their life to Christ last year, they came back and rededicated themselves. So God is moving in, 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 a, in a mighty way uh, all over the world, and I'm just blessed to be a part of, of what he's accomplishing in Kenya. It's not what I've accomplished. It's not what my son has accomplished or, or my wife has accomplished on the, the, the three trips that she's been on with me. It's, it's what God is doing, and, and I'm blessed to be a, be a part of it. This year, we had over 400 professions of faith. And uh, um, this, is, this is a moment of, of salvation at one of the churches, and this is more of a, of a, of a, of a, of a town there in the bush and we met in between two buildings, and our, our bush pastors just went and, and, and rallied the townspeople, and they all came. There was, there was I think, about 200 of them there uh, that day, and um, they were all raising their hands to accept Christ. And this, is, this, is, this happens all over when, when we do this, and, and I wanted to show there was, and 400 is a, is a large number. And some people say, you know, that it takes time to share the gospel, and I've heard of other organizations that's, you know, we, you got to go there for years and, and build a, we, we go here one year and we, we share the Old Testament. The next year we come back, we go into the New Testament and we're building foundations. And I'm like, you know what? These people could be dead next year. Why wait? Tell them the story. Tell them the whole gospel and give a call to action. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take years to share the gospel and build those relationships. God can do it like that, when he's calling somebody and he's prepared their hearts and minds. Our job is to just proclaim it and ask. And the most important part of the gospel message, message uh, in my opinion, is, is not the story of the gospel, although, don't get me wrong, that's critical. It's the call to action. And if we don't give an invitation to respond to God's word, we're just telling stories. And I love telling stories but then people leave, and they know about God, but they don't know what to do. And so we're, we're very much into making sure that they understand the gospel. They understand why they are separated from God, because we start in the beginning, and we go all the way to the ascension of Christ, telling stories at, at, at a children's level. They understand why they need to be saved. They understand sin and separation. They understand who Satan is. And Satan is real. He's not some mythological character that some denominations think, okay? They, under, they understand what God has done to redeem them in his offer of forgiveness and mercy and grace. In many ways, they understand more than 
a lot of people sitting in pews today in America what the story of the Bible is all about. It's about God going to extremes to make a way back for us when we blew it in the garden. So 400 professions of faith, and they're real this time. And that, that was the largest that I, I, I've experienced on a trip. And, and praise the Lord. Glory to God. 29 baptisms, and you might say, well, what happened to the others? Well, the others would have been baptized, but there's very little water over there. And this one particular village that we planted, this was our last day in the field. It was really far there, out, out, really far out. And uh, there happened to be a river out there, one of the largest rivers in Kenya. And after we, we planted the church, the entire congregation said, we, right out of the book of Acts, what hinders us from being baptized? We, as, a, as a new congregation, we walked down to the river. And um, 29 of them were baptized right there in the river. And, and uh, I've been in that river and baptized. And there's my friend Steve baptizing. And you'll see that stick there, and there's someone else in the water, and that's to help keep the crocodiles and the hippos away. And so it's is real. <laughs> this is not the baptism pool up here. You know, there's, there's danger out there, but these people wanted to follow Christ. They were saved, they understood it, and they wanted to follow in believer's baptism. Part of this, this trip, and this will... this will probably make me a little emotional, is the visit to Christ-like Academy. And our missionary partner, Linus, who I've worked with for the last 11 years, um, this is a, an, an academy that he and his, and his wife had, had started and have built up, and it's outside of Nairobi. And Nairobi is a major city in, in Kenya. And their focus is, is getting children out of the slums of Kenya and into not only an education so they could get a job one day, but a, a Christian worldview. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay, and I know that's the focus, one of the a focus of our church and our school here is to prepare our, our youth and our young ones to go out in the world with a biblical worldview. Um, of course, to preach salvation. And there's, there's well over 300 students at Christ Like Academy Kenya and um, there's my son and I, and teacher in, in one of the classrooms. They were actually on winter break. You see all the jackets. Nairobi is in the mountains of Kenya. It's at an elevation of 8,000 feet. It is their winter. It was quite cold there. It's not because my son, Chilly Mike, was there. He didn't bring the chill. It was actually quite cold. I could see my breath. That's that. And we're on the equator, so that kind of tells you how high we were, uh, where this is. Um, but there's a just a little snapshot of the children that are, the goal is to rescue them out of the slums. Now, the slums in Kenya are, are some of the largest and poorest and worst in all of Africa. And Africa is a big continent. The United States can fit inside of Africa more than three times. So the, the, the Nairobi slums are really bad. So they're trying to get, and when you're in the slums, it's hard to get out. It's just a perpetual cycle. You just live in there, you, you, you can't get out. So his ministry there is, is, is to bring these children out and give them an opportunity, not only to meet Jesus, but to, to get a job uh, and, and get out of the slums. A couple of the children, they don't see their own ref reflection. I was taking a selfie with them, and they were just thrilled to see their own faces. So they're looking in the, in the mirror right now, and they're just, they're just thrilled um, to see that. I have thousands of pictures. Oh, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I have hundreds of pictures like this with children in the, out in the bush that never have very rarely ever seen their own reflection. And just their response is, is just, it's just genuine right there. Also, um, at Christ Like Academy, I had the chance to, to visit um, I'll let the video um, tell the story. Well, hello again. I'm standing here inside of the Max Robinson Legacy Science Lab. 
And uh, this was a collaborative effort in the, in the wake of Max's death uh, between Pepin Gibbs and Global Missions 365 and many others uh, to raise shoes for the children here at Christ Like Kenya Academy uh, here in Lemuru, which is just outside of Nairobi. Max was, was very much involved in raising money for shoes. And so as a memorial that, that was started and several hundred pairs of shoes were raised. Uh, several hundred pairs of shoes were, were, don were, were able to be bought through that campaign. And then there were, a need arose uh, for a science lab. The, the government of, of Kenya um, told the school that they had to have a science lab or they could be shut down. And this had to happen within about 30 days. Well, that need was put out and, and because of your generous support, uh, the money was raised for this science lab in about a day. And so here I'm seeing it for the first time. And it's just, it's just beautiful. And I know Max would be, would be very happy and uh, just blessed to be here. I wanna show you the outside of it. They even put his favorite character, one of his favorite characters, Pikachu, on there. But this is a wonderful place. And I just wanna thank all of you who supported. Thank you again to, to Pepin Gibbs. Global Missions 365, Countryside Christian School, um, and all of you that, uh, that gave and, and, uh, and donated this project in the wake of Max's passing. And um, I just ask for your continued prayers for our family as we're, we're still reeling from that and, and dealing with that as a family. And it's, it's, it has been difficult, but uh, today it's, it's wonderful to see this, this, final, this final product here. Uh, thank you, and God bless you all. He did much better than I could have done I'm trying to get through that. <clears throat> but visiting the science lab was, was a big part of this trip. And, uh, and it, was a big, it was a big deal after, after Max, Max passed. And, and again, thank you all for answering that call. And you know how the governments are. The governments are governments. And they put these regulations. They're, they're, I think they're trying to do it here in some fashion um, to, to force you to do something, some kind of compliance. But you know what? God is bigger and mightier than the government. Now, we comply with all government rules and regulations. That's as, as, as ambassadors of Christ, we are commanded to, unless it goes directly against God's sovereign law. But we, we, we obey, but God, we, God will work it all out. He worked it all out here in Nairobi, and that school is still open and thriving and sharing the gospel and, and, and bringing kids out of the slums of, of Nairobi. So thank you all uh, for that. And Max was very much involved in his heart um, to, to raise money for, for shoes. A couple years ago when we visited, we saw a lot of children without shoes, and that was dear to his heart. Max wanted to go to Kenya with me one day. Max wanted to be a preacher. And it's just neat to see his legacy there um, enshrined in Nairobi. Well, I'm going to share a, a very powerful message from a very small book and what some call a minor prophet. But there is nothing minor about this story. There's nothing minor about this prophet. Um, it has a major fish in it, and in it, I want to share with you the Great Commission according to Jonah. And when I was studying Jonah and reading through it, you know, the, the Great Commission is alive there. The gospel message of Jesus Christ is foretold through the story of Jonah. Jonah, in a miraculous way, experienced it. And the real hero of God, or hero of the book, is God. Not Jonah, not a whale. Um, it's God. The miracle, the miracles that God did through this book to bring salvation to a wicked bunch of people in Nineveh. And, and um, as we 
open this, I want to open us in prayer as we, as we prepare for God's Word. So while I'm doing that, uh, we'll be in the book of Jonah. We'll, we'll be starting in chapter 1, so you can find your way there. I'll, if you're on your phone and you want to follow along, I'll, I'll be using the New King James Version if you, if, you, if you want to follow in the same version. But let's pray. Father, I just thank you. Thank you for all the good things that you do. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. And the greatest gift is a gift of salvation, that we do not have to go to hell. That is the good news. You made a way for us. We didn't do it. We can't do it. You did it all. All we have to do is believe and trust. That is our, our theme on the mission field, is to believe and trust in God and what He did for us through Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, who is God in the flesh. And Father, I just ask that you bless us with your presence, that you penetrate our hearts and minds, that you speak to each of us collectively but individually what you want us to hear in this message, the decisions you want us to make individually with this message, and how we can continue to move and answer the Great Commission as Jesus commanded in Matthew 28 and 29. Let my words come from you, Lord. I thank you in Christ's name. Amen. So it's a small book with a very mighty and miraculous message. I was listening to a pastor preach on this. And, um, and he said, this, he said, you know, if a dog bites a man, it's not a very big story. However, if a man bites a dog, that's news. Same if a man catches a fish, it's not a story. Unless you're, you're Jimbo or one of the Keith family and you're too famous, that's a bit of a story. Or if I catch a fish, that's a big story because I don't catch many fish. But generally speaking, a man catches a fish, it's not a big story. Fish catches a man, that's a big story. That's worldwide news. But this story of, of Jonah is not a whale tale. And sometimes the great fish, or the great whale as some call it, overshadows the message because it's such an incredible incredible story and miracle of God. But too often the details of this great fish hinder people from seeing the great and merciful God. This fish, and I'll call it a whale, we don't know, it's probably bigger than a whale, but this whale only appears in three or four verses in the entire Bible. But God's mercy, God's mercy extends from cover to cover of this great book. And that's what I want to focus on, is the mercy of God as seen through the prophet Jonah. I had four things I wanted to share with you about this that when I was studying, but I'm actually going to cut it back to three for time's sake. The first one that we'll see, and we're gonna, I'm going to start in verse 1 and 2, is there's a, there's a divine directive in Jonah, a divine directive, and that we must heed. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. The divine directive, go and preach to the nations. Sound familiar? It should. Jesus told us, Jesus gave us his command before he ascended. This is the great commission according to Jonah. Now, go means go. I don't care what language you're looking at it in, Hebrew, Greek, um, Aramaic, Chinese, go means go. And now if you went to the Gator game last night, and I don't even know if they won, um, but if you went to the Gator game last night, you probably heard the fight song, Get Up and Go, Gators, or something like that. Well, the University of Florida, in my opinion, owes God royalties for that. Because that's original material for the Almighty God. 
he gave that charge to Abraham to get up and get out of your country and go to a place I'll show you. He gave that charge here to Jonah. Get up, go to that wicked nation of Nineveh, a place that Jonah really wanted those people to go to hell. He hated the Ninevites. But God chose him to go, and Jesus gave that charge in the New Testament. Go and make disciples of the nations. The great commission to get up and go is a divine directive. It's not a suggestion. And included in this command is the word from the Lord. We are to preach and teach the gospel message. That's what we do in the mission field. You don't have to go to Africa to do that. You can do it right here in this community. You can do it right here in this church. God has given this charge to us to do. We have to heed the divine directive, that great command. So what happens when we don't heed that call? People go to hell. You might say, well, it's pretty strong preaching on hell from the pulpit. Well, let me tell you, if hell was in more pulpits in America, there would be less hell in the communities. Hell is very real. And I wonder how many people right now are burning in torment in hell because of me, because I wouldn't open my mouth, because of us, because I wouldn't share when God prompted me to. Jesus spoke of hell. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died, went to hell. The beggar Lazarus went to what's equivalent of heaven. And this rich man cried out as he saw Lazarus hanging out with Abraham, hugging on Abraham in, in paradise, what we would call heaven, from afar off. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, it probably didn't go as smooth as that. I imagine it was a great shriek. Father Abraham, help me. I'm in torment here. Bring me a drop of water. This rich man begging Abraham to send, now begging for Abraham to send the beggar Lazarus to bring him a little bit of water for his tongue. Abraham tells him, no, it's not possible. You can't cross over. There's a great gulf here. Where you're at, it's permanent. Where you are after death is permanent. It's done. The rich man says, then, he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they come to this place of torment. You've, I'm sure you've heard the term, misery loves company. Not in hell. It's so bad, he doesn't even want people to come there with him. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The rich man's pleading. That's Lazarus. Go and share the good news with his brothers. Abraham says, no, the scriptures will testify. There is no excuse. You may say, well, that's, that's pretty harsh. If you've never heard, how could he be held accountable? Let me ask you something. Have you ever been, you don't have to raise your hand. Have you ever been pulled over for speeding and claimed you never saw the posted speed limit sign? Now, whether or not you were given a ticket or not is not the point. The point is you are guilty of breaking the speed limit. Period. There's no excuse. Now, the judge might let you off. The, the, the nice police officer might give you a break, but you're still guilty whether you saw it or not. See, 
the divine attributes of God, according to Paul, can clearly be seen in nature. Even the triune, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit can be seen so clearly in nature that there is no excuse for anyone to reject God. This is why I go to Kenya, to other places. This is why I preach whenever given the opportunity like today to preach. This is why I do it. God has given this responsibility to us. We are accountable. Ezekiel tells us we're accountable. If a wicked man is doing wicked, wickedness and we don't preach to him, and he dies in his sins, we're held accountable for that. But if we preach to this wicked man and he dies in his sins, that's on him. You might be thinking, again, that's pretty harsh. People should not be accountable for what they hear if they haven't heard it. But if that were the case, if that were really the case, we would be better off not going to the unreached people groups of Africa. We'd be better off letting them stay isolated so they never hear anything and they can go right to heaven when they die because they're not accountable. That's not how it works. It's a divine directive, not a simple suggestion. Now we'll see it. We're going to move into verse 3. We're going to see a rebellious run. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Immediate disobedience. Immediate. He got up and he went. But as you can see from this cartoon illustration, he definitely went the wrong way. He, did not, he knew where he was going thinking that he could actually escape the presence of the Lord. This, many in the, in the ancient days believed that God only really operated inside the geographical confines of Israel. If you just got to escape that area, you don't have to deal with God anymore. Okay, that's foolish. But how many of us operate like that today? Myself included. We act like God only lives and operates in a church building. Have you ever heard someone say, you shouldn't use that kind of language in church? Or you shouldn't wear that kind of shirt with that language in church? Those statements suppose that God's presence is in a church building and not outside. If you shouldn't use that language in church, why on earth would you use it outside of church? And, you know, and there are many churches where God's not even there. That's a whole other sermon. So you cannot escape the presence and reach of God, period. Tarshish being the farthest known place uh, and, and no, known to that in the world at that time. And it's in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. Nineveh was about 550 miles or so inland from Jerusalem can't get there by boat. And Tarshish likely being Spain or another part of, of Europe. My wife has always wanted me to take her to Spain one day, but I'm not sure after preaching this message. That's a joke. See, so you don't have to go to Spain to be running from God. Tarshish can be the pew that you're sitting in right now. Don't think that just because you come to church on a Sunday morning that you're doing God a favor. I've had that attitude before. How many people are sitting in pews across America today and are spiritually in Tarshish? They're here, but they might as well be across the ocean. Or worse, they're sitting in spiritual danger of going to hell because they're in a church that doesn't preach the gospel. 
and they have a false sense of security. Here's a question. Have you ever been so comfortable? This, when I ask these questions, these are questions that I have asked myself when preparing this. So I want you to know these are, these are self-examination questions. But have you ever been so comfortable in your disobedience that you actually believed you were in the will of God? Jonah was. When that storm broke out, he was fast asleep at the bottom of that boat, comfortable as could be. Here's what the great, some call him the greatest preacher since Paul, Charles Spurgeon, commented about these verses. He said, learn from this about Jonah going down to Tarshish and buying that ticket on that boat and heading off. He said, learn from this that providence alone is not a sufficient guide for our actions. He, Jonah, may have said, it was remarkable that his ship was going to Tarshish just when I reached the port. I gather from this that God was not so disinclined for me to go to Tarshish. Precepts, not providences, are to guide believers. And when Christians quote a providence against a precept, which is to set God against God, they act most strangely. There are devil's providences as well as divine providences. And there are tempting providences as well as assisting providences. So learn to judge between the one and the other. See, the devil will open doors for you too, especially if it's to get out of the will of God. He'll bring that ship. And we say, wow, this is great. He'll bring that other person in your life and say, you know what? You weren't. This, this was your soulmate. God will understand. This, this feels right. See, the devil doesn't come with you at a pitch, with a pitchfork. He comes at you with warm and fuzzy feelings, making you think you're, you're in God's will and doing the right thing. And hoodwinks you. See, Jonah was very comfortable. Again, he was sleeping soundly in the bowels of that ship. You have a divine directive. You have a rebellious run. And now we're going to see a miraculous, a miraculous message. Jonah will experience this message of God's mercy and forgiveness, and then he will preach it. His experience is actually preaching to us future generations the gospel of Jesus. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 20, 40 through 41. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented. They repented, the men of Nineveh, at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus was speaking about himself. Let me tell you something about the men of Nineveh, the Ninevites, and God's love and mercy. The Ninevites are the most wicked people on the earth at that time. They were so brutal that they would skin their captors alive and hang their skins on the walls of their city, brutally torturing people when they conquered them. And in fact, it was, it's even been said that if you were in a neighboring nation or city-state and you heard that the Ninevites were marching against you, most of those people, they would just kill themselves rather than be subject to the torture of the Ninevites. See, Jonah, a big reason why he ran was he hated the Ninevites and he wanted them to go to hell. But God's mercy... God loves and desires everyone to repent. So God sends a great storm, and I want you to note that God sends the storm. This is a miracle storm. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. This is quite a storm. And if you remember, remember this, is, this, is, this is foreshadowing Jesus. 
Remember when Jesus was in the storm sleeping on the boat and those sailors were afraid. These are, these are hardened sailors. They're not like me going out there and the little wind comes out and I tell Jimbo, take me back, we're going to die. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us that we may not perish. I'm going to skip to verse 9. So he said to them, Jonah, I, I'm, a, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. Fear, not afraid. He said, I, I trust in the Lord. I have reverential awe of the Lord. Basically, I'm a child of God. I'm a, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. See, people, you know, for people who think that I can do what I want as long as it doesn't affect you, don't judge me. And if I want to do this and do that, I know it may be bad, but that, that's me and, and it's not harming you. Let me tell you something. Sin has collateral damages. Look at these sailors. They are caught up in Jonah's sinful disobedience. Now, they weren't children of God yet, but they didn't do anything to deserve death at that point. But it was Jonah. So this moral relativism argument is from the pit of hell. From the pit of hell. Yes, sin can take others down with you who are innocent bystanders, for lack of a better phrase. So then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing even more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then it would become calm. Basically, sacrifice me. Because it was expected that if you go in that sea, you're going to die. There's no life vest. You're not going to survive that. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. This tempest, this storm is God's judgment. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. You ever been in a storm or in a, in a rebellious run, a storm from God or a rebellious run, and then tried even harder your way to get out of it? How'd that work out? Usually it doesn't. It didn't for these sailors. They didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. They said, we're just going to row harder. We, we're sailors. We know what we're doing. Didn't work. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Now this fear is not afraid. Now this is that same reverential awe that Jonah had. Now they believed. These heathens just were converted to the God of the Bible. So they feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Again, a great fish. The Lord prepared it. It's a miracle. And Jonah was in the belly three days and three nights. Now you might think this is a, a whale of a story and this certainly must be some kind of fiction or a parable. Well, I tell you, I read this story on the internet, so it, again, it must be true. Um, in 1891, this apparently was in the newspapers uh, in the northeast of a man named James Bartley, um, who was on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a whaling vessel. And um, he was, they were off the Falkland Islands, and they were trying to harpoon these whales, and one of the boats was sunk through all this, and one of the sailors was lost. Two sailors were lost. One they knew was lost. The other one they just couldn't find, so they presumed he was lost. That was James Bartley. 
Well, they ended up harpooning that whale and bringing him on board. And, you know, the next day as they're, as they're, they're cutting him up, they, they got to his stomach of this whale. And they noticed something moving around, and they opened it up. And there was that lost sailor. His name was Bartlett. Again, according to the Internet. This happened in 1891. And um, he was bleached, and it took him a couple weeks to come out of it. But in, in a matter of a couple weeks, he was back returning to his vessel. And um, it was a miracle. Now, this is some story. And I, I skip, for time's sake, I skipped a lot of the details. But you get the point. After all, you know, you know, I found it on the Internet. And other preachers far better known than I have used this in their sermons about Jonah. It's kind of where I got the idea. But to be honest with you, I don't know if this story is true. And I really don't care if it's false. See, modern stories that supposedly validate or support biblical narratives carry very little weight with me. Let me tell you something, friends. I, I not only believe that the story of Jonah is true as it is written, I would believe the story if it stated that Jonah swallowed the whale and the whale spent three days in Jonah's belly. Why? Because the Bible says so. Period. The Bible is the only absolute truth that we have in a world full of deception and lies. So this message is delivered. Jonah preaches it. So the Lord, Jonah, I'll skip part of this. He repents in the whale's belly. It's a beautiful psalm. I encourage you to read Jonah chapter 2. He repents. And the Lord spoke to the fish. I have it here. And it vomited Jonah onto dry land. And Jonah goes, and now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Don't you love it that we have a God of second and beyond chances? Amen. Yes. So a second time, God tells them the same command. It hasn't changed. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. <laughs> Jonah got up and went. He learned. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey extent, and Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The people, so the people of Nineveh believed God, this wicked, wicked nation. They believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth, and from the greatest to the least of them. It says that this city was probably well over a million. This has been called one of the greatest revivals in the history of the world. Jonah experienced the miraculous gospel. Then Jonah preached the gospel of repentance to the Lord. See, Jonah foreshadowed Jesus who would sacrifice himself, suffer God's wrath for us, spending three days in the grave, and then being resurrected by God after three days. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Ninevites were great sinners. The sailors were great sinners. God forgave them and accepted them when they repented. Jesus did this for you and me so that some Jonah would come and share the good news with us. And the good news is this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Not maybe, not if God feels like it, not if you do more good things than bad things. Believe. Put your trust in Christ. The Bible also says, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Jonah had beautiful feet. Pastor Bill has beautiful feet. Chili Mike has beautiful feet. Lloyd has beautiful feet. Mark has beautiful feet. John has beautiful feet. Louis has beautiful feet. 
Melissa has beautiful feet, and I've seen her feet. They are beautiful. <laughs> Stephen and Maxine have beautiful feet. Bob and Terry have beautiful feet. Robbie has beautiful feet. There's another who had beautiful feet. And his impact was felt here and across the globe. And I want you to listen to these beautiful feet. And this is also a tie-in for the wonderful things that happen here on Wednesday nights. At Awana's and our children's program. This is a product of that. So if you heard Miss Jessie's call, and Miss Jessie has beautiful feet. And I've never seen them, but they're beautiful. <laughs> but if you heard her call for teachers, I wanted you to see what happens on Wednesday nights. And I think Miss Libby's here. I saw her. This is a video that she took when asking children to share their testimony. I want you to hear from the beautiful feet of Max. Okay, here's Max giving his testimony. Before I met Jesus or God... I always felt like I was like, I was like, I'm a good person. I do things. I was like, we all make mistakes, right? And I always felt like, but when I did a good thing, I was like, I don't feel like that's enough. Like, when you do a good deed and you feel like someone pats you on the back, but it just doesn't feel like you did anything. And then I was just always like down, I feel like. Because when I did a good thing, I had like a, like a little bit of joy. I was like, oh, yay. But then I just got back down. I was like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I always, and I was always scared, like what's gonna happen when I grow up. I was like, I don't know. And then I was going to church at that time and my mom was saved then. And I always like went to church and I believe and I like, they were teaching me about this Bible. I was like, what's the Bible? And, and Everybody's there, like, they're all so joyful. I'm like, why can't I have that joy? And they just talk about, like, these things. I'm like, who's, who's Jesus? Who's Peter? Who's any of this, these people? And who's this God they're talking about? Why do we pray to him? And then um, on a drive back from Wildwood to come to my mom's, my mom just like, let's pray. I was like, okay. And then I asked her, I was like, who do we pray to? She's like, you know the person that you hear in church who's, who we're all like always talking to? That's God. I was like, oh yeah, I heard about him in this book. And she's like, you want to know something about that book? I was like, what? She's like, that's real. I was like, it is? I was like, with that guy walking on water? And she's like, yeah, that's all real. And she prayed the, she taught me about, she was like, all that stuff's real, and God's real, and Jesus sent his son to die on the cross for us, and that's Easter. I was like, oh, that's what it is. It's not the Easter bunny. And then I prayed the sinner's prayer, and then I felt like from that point on, I was always, like, joyful. I always felt like I was enough, and I could do, and I felt like I always had faith in, like, everything that I did. And then I met Jackie. Mike and Michael, and we we're all just a happy family. We're a mixed family all together. And that's my testimony. Awesome. Thank you so much, Max. That was great. I don't know how many times that has been viewed since Max's death, but it's, it's in the hundreds, if not thousands. And I don't know how many people have come to Christ because of that. And the more that do... He's still reaping the rewards in heaven for his testimony. Max had beautiful feet. Not only did he want to be a preacher, he prayed. He would pray for his family members that didn't know Jesus. Write them in his journal. I don't know if I've ever... We've ever shared this with you, but the night that, that he died, I 
when he went to go see his body. And my beautiful wife just prayed over him. All the people that Max had been praying for. There was a handful that he prayed for almost daily for salvation. Have we stopped praying, church family, for the lost? I know we all know people who are lost. Have we stopped praying? That's going to be part of our invitation today. Max believed and trusted in Jesus. The people of Nineveh, the wicked people of Nineveh, believed. The sailors, the heathen sailors on the boat, believed and repented. What's your decision today? What is God speaking to you today? Remember, being in church is not salvation. Salvation is as easy as ABC. Admit, believe, confess. Admit that, you, that you're a sinner. Basically agree with God that we're in the wrong. Believe that Jesus Christ paid the way with his death, burial, and resurrection. By his blood, paid for all of our sins. And confess that. We're going to have that opportunity today. Maybe it's a rededication like my our brothers and sisters in the Kenyan bush. And they are your brothers and sisters too. 69 of them rededicated their lives the Sunday that we were there. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ. Maybe you've done that recently and you want to share that. I'm going to be down here at the front. Maybe you want to accept Christ. Maybe you want to come and pray for salvation at the, at the altar for someone who was lost, who was in spiritual danger. And maybe you need the courage to know how to talk to them. Understand that. God will give it to you. Maybe you want to join this, this wonderful church that's full of beautiful feet. Because this is a gospel preaching church. This is a missions-minded church. Mark's going to play a song. Whatever your decision is, come down. And if you want to come down and just sit on the front... And, and, and we can speak privately, we can, but if you want to come to the altar, the altar is open. Whatever your decision is, if you're physically able to, would you stand? <laughs> yet. Uh, Brother Steve Carlson has a few words to say, but if you want to stay behind and you want to talk or, or need someone to pray with, Steve will be here. I'll be here.
If you want to join our wonderful Wednesday night children's program, you make a beeline to Miss Jessie and experience those moments that you just witnessed. Steve? All right, have a seat for just a second. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and, and shift. It's actually continuing along, um, but in the same vein. I want to go ahead and start where Jesse uh, began and let you know that, uh, you know, many times uh, we have the opportunity to go ahead and serve. Um, the very first time that I was involved in children's ministry was helping in VBS as a teenager. We didn't have teenage VBS and so they enlisted the teens to be involved in VBS. And out of that, at 17 years old, I had the privilege of being a Sparky leader for second grade. And it turned out to be girls. It was kind of the running joke in our church that a 17-year-old guy was the teacher of the second grade girls. Uh, but uh, that was who were coming. Uh, but anyway, and, and so maybe you're a teenager here. And you love being a part of Frontline and all that kind of stuff. But maybe God's touching your heart uh, to be involved in direct ministry. And you can still be a part of Frontline, but help out with the children as well. That's a great opportunity and uh, another thing. As we look at all the different things, uh, you know, we've got uh, a short-term group going out here. And it's wonderful how our church has supported short-term missions and everything else. And... Um, as we think about that, uh, you know, God's blessing those things. But I want to go ahead and bring you uh, to mind uh, the royal family. They're actually uh, people who are on the field every day. They went to the mission field seven and a half years ago. Uh, we've been in uh, ministry for 25 years. And I will tell you, there are times that funds have been short and God has made it possible for me to be able to get a, uh, you know, a side job or to be able to get a part-time job so that I could pay the mortgage so that we didn't go ahead and have our electric turned off. But when you're overseas and you're in Thailand, you don't come back from this mission trip, go back to work and, and uh, go out to Sonny's. Um, the royal family are struggling right now, big time struggling, and, and they need a miracle. And uh, whether we, uh, you know, agree that all the things that uh, the preparations that they might ought to have done ahead of time, uh, uh, you know, to make their life a little bit easier now, right now they're in the field. I want to go ahead and show the video clip. We saw, saw this a couple weeks ago, but listen for a moment how God is using this family to be able to reach a part of the world where it was literally illegal to preach the gospel. Go ahead. This village was about 65 years ago and uh, no, no allowed to Christian to live here. They grow opium for living. Drug dealers and live here so no outsider can come in. No preacher can come and preach. Because our preachers don't want people to grow opium. Good afternoon, everybody. We're here in uh, northern Thailand, Ban Blang village, about two hours from Chiang Mai. Um, just wanted to give you a little info about this place uh, as far as how things are going here lately. Uh, there have been some conversions and some baptisms. Um, of course, we've got the land here that we're standing on prepared uh, for the building phase of the project. Uh, this village is a coffee growing village, whereas it used to be an opium growing area, the entire area. So God has done some things here, and we just know there's going to be a wonderful future for these people. We thank you very much you come and teach our children for our, our children's future. Thank you very much. Hello, brothers and sisters in America. This is the church building site. Uh, the church building will be 10 meters by 20. 
And this is the stage. And this part is a, a parsonage and kitchen. Two parsonage uh, rooms and one kitchen. So all together will build L shape. All right, so you can see uh, that is the result of the monies that you have already sent for the actual church ground to be purchased. The site work is done. They're trying to faithfully fulfill, uh, you know, the designation of the funds that we've sent and everything. But I want to tell you right now that uh, the royal family themselves need a miracle. When I say a miracle, I'm not over-exaggerating. Um, we need to go ahead and prayerfully consider what God would have us to do over and above what our regular giving is. Sometimes we have the mindset, well, they're in the church budget and the church is uh, providing and all that kind of stuff. Um, let me tell you what they receive as a result of our church missions giving. They receive $3,600 a year. $3,600 a year divided into four quarters is $900. And so every three months, they get $900. That's $300 a month. Um, and so as we think about that, um, they have a few other supporters that are supporting them. But essentially, they're on the field. They're doing the work of the ministry for approximately uh, five to $600 a month. That's what they're making. Now think about, uh, now I know that the cost of living to a degree is less, although gasoline is $8 a gallon, so that's not less. Um, and so think about how you could survive on five to six hundred dollars a month. And so they've had several issues without going into a long detail, things that come into our lives. We all have things that come into our lives, right? But right now, they're needing a miracle. This is not going to be something that's a long-term solution, but this is something that would make a difference today. And so I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider what God would have you to do hilariously uh, because God's word says that when we find a brother in need and we go ahead and say, um, I'm praying for you, um, I hope you feel good and, and uh, things go well for you and then we walk away and do nothing, then we're disobeying God's word. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and pray. We're going to go ahead and get our men at the back of the room. Maybe you're not prepared to go ahead and give today. Um, but maybe you could bring back a check tomorrow. And what we would like to do by Wednesday, we would like to be able to send some funds to them so that um, they can see that God's still here in their need and that God's still working through Countryside Baptist Church. This, I know this is a stretch, and I, I'm asking you to go ahead and trust the Lord just like uh, we ask the children to trust the Lord to be saved, just like we ask people in uh, the bush to go ahead and trust the Lord. And uh, so let's pray. Lord, we love you. And I thank you for this whole theme of missions today. You are an awesome and a mighty God. And I know that uh, all of us have bills to pay. All of us have things that we want to do and, and uh, plans that we would like to see accomplished. But Lord, I pray uh, as we uh, celebrate what's already being done there in Thailand through the royal family, that in their hour of need, as they're calling out and asking for special help, that we would be your conduit uh, for a miracle in this family. And so, Lord, we just pray, thank you in advance for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, uh, you could do cash, you can go ahead and do checks. If you would like to come back and do something different, just put it on the memo line, uh, Royal Miracle, okay? And um, we'll go ahead and take those funds through Wednesday, and, and before Miss Jessie goes on her trip, uh, we'll make sure that funds get dispersed to the Royals this week. Thank you so much. You're dismissed.